going live everywhere. <laughs> All righty, where is everyone logging in from? Can we see the chat? I think I've got too many browsers open here. Um, oh, here we go. Oh, hi, Carl from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Spain. Aid from Nigeria. Hey, Aid. Dan from Stockholm, Carlos from Mexico. I'm always really surprised about how international our sessions are. It seems like there's always participants from every corner of the globe. Thanks for joining, everyone. Colombia, Nestor. Hey, Nestor. Larry from NYC. I'm actually in Zurich in Switzerland, and David is in San Francisco, I believe. Yeah, outside San Francisco in uh, Northern California. Cool. Hey, Martin. I think we're not too far from each other here in Zurich. Yulia from Russia. Hello. America from Lisbon. Hello. Yep, you can start the questions, um, Ricardo, for sure. We're going to get started in just one minute. If you can all add them to uh, the Q&A. Um, so there's a Q&A bar that you can all access um, in the Zoom panel. Uh, if you just add your questions in there, we'll get started uh, just in a second. I always like to wait until it's perfectly on double zeros and we go. <laughs> it's a Swiss thing. It is, it's Alex, it's Alex. Oh, and um, by the way, everyone, um, Alex was meant to be here today. He had to tend to something urgently. He might still join us, but um, it's just that. Uh, David and I today. Um, I won't be answering any of your questions because I'm not the author. David is all the brains behind here. So um, he'll be walking you through everyone. Right, it's uh, five o'clock here. Um, so let's get started. Welcome everyone to this Ask Me Anything session with uh, David Bland today, the author of Testing Business Ideas. Um, obviously, um, here are our speakers. Alex, uh, unfortunately, uh, can't make it quite yet, but uh, perhaps join us um, in a little while. Um, this is the book that you all know about and uh, surely all have a copy of. If you don't have a copy, I would highly recommend you go and uh, buy one. It's uh, really one of the best books um, I've seen in my entire life. And we've got um, a whole suite of tools and basically a uh, web page where you can access all the free tools um, that are mentioned in the book, um, as long as, uh, as well as all of the exclusive content. So if you'd like to get access to that, just head over to strategize.com dash test, and uh, you'll be able to download all of the tools talked about in the book. Uh, just like to mention that this session is brought to you by our Testing Business Ideas Virtual Masterclass, which is uh, going to be taking place later this year in September, so after the summer. I think it's on the 15th, David, is that it? Yes, it's going to be three days, um, uh, well, over three days, so it's going to be really exciting. Yeah, it, it debuted in, in February in London, right, before kind of pre-COVID, when we could still kind of do groups and stuff. But uh, do you want to just uh, run us through um, what it's about and uh, what people could expect? Yeah, we're really excited. Um, been doing a lot of virtual work anyway before this uh, pandemic, unfortunately, hit us. And um, we had a really amazing in-person masterclass on testing business ideas in London before um, the pandemic hit, uh, at least here in the United States anyway. Um, and we've been just working, uh, translating it all and making sure it flows really well for a virtual workshop. It's very interactive. So it's not a webinar, not a webinar. It's a very much an interactive experience online, lots of exercises, interactions. So, um, if you are a fan of the book, it's, it's a very much a, you know, taking you through the book, through exercises, getting you to know each other. Um, so it should be, it should be a lot of fun. Yeah. I'm certainly looking forward to it. We just did, uh, the bit, the, um, uh, building invincible companies one with Alex and team and uh, it was it was a really really cool experience uh, really great learning experience but I'll stop that sorry we'll get right back to the session guys um, okay so uh, we've got one question from Stephen Simmons um, he is asking is there a recognized strategized community where career jobs are shared uh, actually that's probably not the best question to start with but um uh, so I read the what, wrong one there, but we've got, can you take us through the iterative cycle, cyclic roadmap from idea to validated business model? 
Yeah, I, <clears throat> that's a great question. So I think, um, you know, from our experience in working with uh, teams all around the world, and I, I, I'm very fortunate, I get to work with companies in different uh, industries, so automotive, pharma, retail, uh, software, you name it. And um, the common theme I've seen through all of them is that if you lean too hard on uh, just the business side, as far as business design, or too hard on just the testing side, which means you're kind of going through that lean startup cycle, um, it, it causes some weird dynamics and you might actually fail in a, in a slow way, not, you know, not quickly and learn. And so what we've seen time and time again is how to balance both. And that's what we try to convey in the book. Uh, also, Alex's um, Invincible Company, also with the portfolio, trying to get you to go from new ideas to more sort of, uh, you know, cash cow, stable ideas, right, uh, over time, which is a very iterative process. Um, but yeah, it's you know, from the business design side, like how do you ideate, how do you prototype out some business opportunities, like where you play, um, how do you assess those opportunities? So um, there are different ways you can assess a model, like my switching costs or how defensible is this thing I'm about to create. And then on the testing side, it's like, where's my risk? So we map out uh, our hypotheses, we design the experiment and we learn from that. And then we feed that back into the business design side. So it's um, very telling, I think, um, when I go, you know, I, I mentor startups in Silicon Valley out here too, and uh, they're all in on the testing side, right? And they're just like, test, 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 test. And then I'm like, what's your business model? And they're like, oh, we'll figure that out later. And um, that I think, um, not to get on a rant here, but I think is coming back to, to bite us. Um, we have a lot of these really giant companies now that, um, just said, we'll just raise VC money and it'll all work out later. And we'll just keep testing. We'll keep doing our product thing, you know? And uh, these companies don't have sustainable business models. Like the entire gig economy is uh, held up by VC money. And it's, it's very um, troubling to me because now when it comes back to, okay, now we have to actually treat our, you know, uh, employee, our contractors as employees, so to speak, and regulations change. Uh, it's all like, let's just push back on the laws and fight them, you know? And so, uh, I don't really believe in this. We'll just figure out the business model later approach. Um, and so I've been doing a lot of kind of unwinding of that in accelerators that I work with. But, um, and if you just have if heavily go on the business design side, then um, you don't actually go off and test it. And, and so you have this amazing looking business model and all these canvases, right? But you can't just go build the thing and then see if you got it right. You have to test your way through it. So. Um, the cycle is very much on the business design side, going through that, and then on the testing side, going through that, and then having each one inform one another. Excellent. <clears throat> Thanks for that, David. We're going to move on to the next question. We've got lots coming in, so we're going to cover a lot, I think, in this half an hour. Um, so I had one by email from Martin de Florent. And um, I thought it was interesting because he says, he's asking how important is it for companies to increasingly convert skills into products for several markets instead of product uh, for a specific market? I think especially now, uh, it's very important. Um, you'll notice this was kind of happening also before the pandemic. Um, you'll notice that, um, you know, um, car companies, for example, you know, we're not a car company anymore, we're, we're a mobility company, right? And I've worked with car companies, um, some of the biggest in the world. And it, it's a shift I'm seeing across all of them. You'll notice like in the messaging and the marketing, it's very much a, no, no, we're not longer a car company, we're a mobility company. And when you start to think about it, it makes a lot of sense, right? If all of your domain expertise and your skills go into a product, which is a car that serves a market or a series of markets. Um, I think car companies know that um, sales aren't gonna go up into the right forever. You know, um, one, that's not great for the environment. Um, so we're, we're introducing a lot of more like car sharing, you know, connected car things with your car can um, serve multiple people or multiple owners even. Um, I, I think, you know, Elon Musk's dream of Tesla, right, is your Tesla goes off and makes money for you while you sleep, you know, doing ride sharing and delivering stuff for you. Uh, you may laugh at that, but I, I don't think he's joking when he says that's his dream. Um, he really means that. So you think of your car as a service then, and then people go, what is car ownership? And should I really be dumping all my time investment in R&D into cars? And you'll notice, um, you know, uh, people are diversifying. They're going into bike sharing. They're going into um, helping the elderly kind of get around, you know, as far as if at home or, 
or uh, at assisted living facilities, like the mobility aspects for that. Um, you know, before the Olympics actually were, were canceled in Japan, there was a lot of mobility stuff going around that whole design of that event, right? And so there's some really interesting stuff from IC companies shifting from, we're really good at uh, X, you know, but we can't just translate all that skill into a car. Uh, and it's not just automotive. If you look at, um, you know, like I work with paint companies, right? And they're like, we're a paint company, but now we're a color company. And it's like, you know, there's a whole, whole business model around color that doesn't just uh, manifest itself as a product of, for paint. You know, um, paint is for 100 years about it's the same way we're doing, you know, it's roughly the same way we're making paint, right? It hasn't changed all that much. But if you start thinking of all the domain and color expertise you have, then you become like really broad as far as how you apply that, that thinking into different markets. So I see this trend. If you'll notice, just pay attention to how companies brand themselves. It's super fascinating to me when uh, they go from I'm a blank company product, you know, focus to a I'm sort of a, a ability or a, like this verb kind of thing, you know? And um, I think it's smart because you tap into all your company's expertise and capabilities and skills, and you try to translate that into different um, opportunities that are still close to your core and what you know. You're not uh, going from like, I'm an automobile company, so now I'm making like potato chips or something. You're still doing something that's really near and dear. But um, I think it's just a, a trend we're going to continue to see as companies rebrand and uh, subtly change from I'm a product company to more of like on this capability that we're delivering across different uh, different verticals. And I, excellent answer there, Dave. <laughs> um, I think actually Sebastian Becker brings in a great uh, question just on kind of top of what you said there. He's asking in more research intensive settings, so like pharmaceuticals, engineering solutions, uh, where do you have to spend time developing inventions first? How can you approach testing and experimenting there? Yeah, well, a lot of it, uh, when I work with R&D groups, I do quite a bit. Um, what I'm noticing is the business modeling is getting pushed more and more onto them. And so usually uh, executives are frustrated where they've um, maybe not aligned the R&D group well to the overall strategy of the company or um, same thing with innovation labs. You know, they, they're working through something but maybe it's not aligned really well and they don't have guardrails on where they're playing. Um, and um, I don't know, I, from my experience, the like innovation labs you have about two or three years to figure it out before the executives shut it down. And so if you're not providing overall value, um, they just get frustrated, which is very different from venture capital, right? Venture capital takes a very much longer term view, whereas inside kind of corporate America or corporate right, just around the world, uh, I haven't met a lot of people that have patience for that kind of time horizon. They're not gonna wait that long. It's gonna be um, you know, uh, a shorter time horizon for them. And so um, you know, if you're constantly working R&D and creating inventions and tech, and then you're kind of throwing it over the wall for someone to monetize it. I think that's inherently risky. So what I've been doing when I work with R&D groups, it's been kind of pulling that business modeling upstream more into like, how do we actually create a sustainable business model for this tech? Because if you think like, just picture your business model canvas, right? Really, you're just working in the key resources box. If you're like working through some kind of cool tech and that's like the scope of your work, you're kind of starting from the backstage in the key resources box. Like your tech is basically just a sticky in that box. And you have to fill, you have to figure out the rest of the entire canvas. And so what's the value prop of that tech you're creating? What customer are you serving? How do you actually reach that customer? Um, that is like a technology push. And if you don't figure that out, it's inherently risky to throw that over the wall to the rest of the organization and say, okay, go monetize this amazing thing we just built. So um, just from my experience, I'm seeing um, R&D groups and more of these like tech push groups, technology push groups, um, adapt more of like business model thinking because they realize for them to be successful, it's not just creating successful tech and hoping other parts of the org figure out the, the monetization strategy. They have to be thinking about that earlier on because it's really hard in that handoff. I mean, the context is lost. And uh, this idea of I received a thing and I don't know the context of how you created this thing and I'm supposed to create like a sustainable model from it, it's just really hard to pull off well. Yeah, and um, actually, Sebastian, I hope that, answer, that answers your question, but we did um, a corporate, in a, like a, a webinar yesterday with Bayer 
uh, he's a global pharmaceutical company. And we, we talk, uh, we talked a lot. They gave their whole kind of presentation around the, um, their portfolio map and, uh, uh, the, the kind of full of, of, uh, of experiments that they're doing. So, uh, keep an eye out for that. That's coming out tomorrow. I see Alex has joined us. Hey, Alex. Um, but yes, Sebastian, I uh, hope that answers your question. I'll uh, move on to the next one because we've got a lot coming in here. Uh, Bogdan, hey Bogdan, is a Strati regular, I always, always see on here, so good to see you. Um, he says, I understand how you test product desirability, but how do you test for whole business models? Because that is where the competitive advantage comes from. Yeah, maybe I'll start with Alex to jump in. Um, I think desirability isn't just your product. You know, it's the overall value proposition. Is there a fit with the customer? How you reach them? How do you build relationships with them? What kind of the relationship do you have with them? Um, that's just one piece of the puzzle that we often focus uh, way, well, I've seen both. I've seen us focus almost no time on that and it's a build it and they will come kind of thing. And then I've seen the, um, we spend way too much time on that. And then we don't figure out viability, which is cost and um, revenue. You know, uh, ideally that one box, you know, uh, is less than the other to, to make it sustainable. And then feasibility, which is the whole backstage, like your key partners, activities, resources. Um, if you can't actually execute the infrastructure to make it happen, it doesn't matter how desirable your product is. And I, I constantly have this exercise I do in my workshops and advising where we say, like, imagine a product you really loved that doesn't exist anymore. And everybody can think of that product. And it's almost always because the business model failed. It's not because the product wasn't great. It's because they didn't have a sustainable business model and they didn't test desirability and viability out uh, you know, um, enough. You know? So I think it's um, unfortunate that that uh, continues to occur. We see great products just have terrible business models or, or just the, not the awareness of what all it takes to actually run it and scale it. Awesome. Um, thanks for that, David. Maybe one last one um, I'll ask from, so uh, Raphael Camus asked by email, he's asking, how do I overcome a team's resistance to creating rough experiments? <laughs> I, think, I think Alex is working on this down here, but uh, I, I think the, the idea of rough is kind of, uh, that's a really interesting uh, uh, word to use. I, I think um, even in our early experiments, we do try to be disciplined about like have a hypothesis, design your experiment, what are you going to measure, what's your success criteria. So if you're following that, um, there is some element of just, uh, you know, your hypothesis is testable, and discreet and uh, uh, precise and, and all that. But I think, um, uh, I, I think people almost have an aversion of just uh, I, they're not really, they don't feel really uh, confident in their ability to design the right kind of test uh, or, or the right kind of experiment and go run it. And therefore they're just very nervous about, well, I'm going to do all this work and then I'm going to get this learning, but maybe I'll mess it up or maybe I'll put all my biases in there. And um, I think uh, you're running giant slow experiments is not going to help you though. <laughs> like you don't want to spend three months or six months on something and realize you're wrong. You want to spend like a week and just learn a little bit and kind of build up your evidence over time. So um, it's a very much cultural thing. And also when you, when you hear that kind of feedback from your team, think about your culture. Do you have a culture where it's like safe to fail? Do you have a culture where if you run something and it's wrong, do you get fired or do you, is it a career limiting move? Because a lot of times I've noticed that when I get pushback on working that way, it's because people feel like, you know, they're going to be penalized for not having a bunch of success to report. So I'd also look at your culture really, um, really closely on that one too. Okay, can you hear me now? Because, uh, yeah. good. So I was trying to speak and I realized I didn't have my mic on. So beginner's mistake, but I've never been on stage before. So I really don't know how this works. So <laughs> just, I wanted to add to what uh, David already said really well, uh, just the, the, the question before about, don't, shouldn't we test everything, right? So actually I had a breakthrough in my thinking a couple of years back when Someone in a big pharmaceutical company said, Alex, this is brilliant because we actually tried to always test the whole idea. You know, oh, we're going to make a project in this in this field. And they always tried to test the whole idea. And how do you test the whole idea? You actually build a business, right? So for me, the breakthrough was when I understood the whole value of what we're doing is we're taking an idea, kind of shaping it with this, 
then we're shaping it with this. Okay, so it's still the whole idea. We try to make everything explicit as fast as we can, maybe four hours or so. But then, <laughs> this is where it gets interesting. We say, okay, probably this thing is not gonna work. So what do we need to do first? We need to ask ourselves, what are the underlying hypothesis, the things that need to be true for this idea to work, right? And this depends on your idea. So you take this big idea, you break it into small chunks. And as David just said, right, we have desirability, we have feasibility, we have viability, maybe adaptability. But we broke down the idea into smaller chunks that we can test. And then, you know, what, what uh, David opened my eyes up to is, okay, well, we can now turn this, you know, into the assumptions map. So if you have the testing business ideas book, you say, well, now we take all of these assumptions and, and hypothesis and we try to prioritize them. But it's this really, this, this is really, really important. And I see, and I'm curious, David, about you, I see too few teams being aware that they're taking a big idea and they're breaking it down into smaller chunks. And smaller chunks, not in the sense of, oh, which product feature can I test? But we're testing the whole idea. Because at the end of the day, you're building a business, you're not building a product, right? So what I don't see enough is this idea of prioritization, saying, okay, these are the most important ones that we don't know yet. People go right into building something and, you know, very product focused. Maybe, okay, we're going to look at the customer segments, jobs, pains, and gains, but it's about the whole business. So this whole idea of prioritizing, breaking down your big idea into smaller chunks of risks, that is something I still don't see being done systematically enough. So David, throwing back the question to you, do you see teams, you know, now prioritize their hypothesis more or are they still kind of stuck in this loop of, oh, we got to, you know, kind of figure out if, if people want this product? I think they're slowly starting to, and I think it's because some of this work is permeated through other things. Um, you know, uh, I know design sprints are very popular now and Google, uh, Google has basically, um, I gave a talk before the pandemic, I gave a talk with, um, with Google in San Francisco and, and they've taken this two by two and kind of pulled it into their design sprint process, right? And so uh, I think when you have a team going through that process now, they're at least attempting to prioritize. But I feel like um, it's just, we don't give space to have that conversation, you know? Because it, it, it's an uncomfortable conversation. If you don't know how to facilitate it, you're not sure how to address your all your fears of you're building the wrong thing with your teammates. And then you just kind of keep that back in your head and it's always there, like whether you're coding or designing or uh, testing out different channels and all that, like, it feels like am I here? We're working on something that matters, you know. And so I think just giving people the space to have the conversation, and then say, okay, what's the most important thing that if we have no evidence to support and we're wrong, we're done. Like this whole initiative, it doesn't matter how beautiful the product looks. This whole initiative's done. And um, I think it's slowly coming along because it's been adapted by governments and by you know uh, people running sprints now. But we have a lot of work to do. I feel there's still not enough space for the conversation and then people just jump to build because that's kind of what they what they know. Excellent. Thank you both for those very detailed answers and Alex for joining in with the iPad. It was a very slick. Um, so we have a question from Lloyd. Um, he's asking Alex and David, what, are, what is the strongest and most memorable or successful experiment that you've recently seen? So I'll, I'll let David go first. So hard. There's so many, uh, and, and when you say successful, I, I think that's somewhat uh, misleading, right? Because some of the most interesting ones are the ones that don't uh, don't succeed. Uh, I won't talk about the company, but I'll talk about one that succeeded but in the wrong way. <laughs> uh, I was working with a company, and they're working on. Um, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Harry. Potter. Everybody's seen the Harry Potter movies, right? And the and the um, the, the paintings and how they subtly move. There's a term for that, it's called cinemagraph. And so imagine being online and seeing something very high res, you know, and, it, and, and then just subtly shifts and changes and catches your eye and like moves. Not a GIF, you know, just like a, a different kind of format. And so working through a team is like really cool, we're working through like what's the value prop to what segment. And we thought this is a great B2B play, like people are gonna be on Pinterest and they're gonna wanna see their stuff like subtly shift or on a Shopify store or something. They, they want to see it like drag people's attention to buy something, right? In testing it, uh, 
overwhelming positive response from the market. It was all for people wanting to animate their cats and their dogs. <laughs> B to C, we're like, what is going on? It's like a flood. It's like we opened the floodgates and only marketed to like, like really passionate pet owners, you know? And so um, it succeeded, but not in the way the team who was interested in the B to B play was not interested in like almost like a Snapchat tile style thing, you know? And so it was just really interesting to see it happen because sometimes you build something or you're testing something. And um, actually, we did this without software. We were just manually, it's a long story, but we were manually creating the animations. Um, and see like who, who it resonates with, and it's not always who you intend. And, and it's like how you respond to that matters, you know? So I just thought that was a really funny story of something that was like so much like B2B, we got this figured out. And then the influx of like, make my cat sparkle. <laughs> like Everybody wants their cat to sparkle. What's going on? Um, and so we ended up parking the idea. Um, but I just thought it was a really interesting example of it was successful, but the, with the wrong uh, customer segment. I'll, I'll give you two things. And one actually comes from Strategizer. Um, you know, when we, when the pandemic started and we asked ourselves, should we do virtual masterclasses? It was, you know, in a context where everybody was doing stuff for free. So it's not, you know, you can't just assume people are gonna pay. And rather than saying, okay, we're gonna go with a certain price. We said, well, we don't know how much people are gonna pay. And we launched this uh, testing, you know, this experiment to see if they would pay 1,300, 1,600 or 1,900 as a price. And our regular masterclass bid over 2,000. So pretty close to the regular price. And something very unexpected happened. <laughs> the most expensive 1,900 actually had double the conversion rate of the cheapest one. Right? Something you would just never assume. Like you, how can you know? You can't, you can't, right? So if we had just gone for, you know, the average price, oh, 1,600. Well, we would have left a lot of money on the table, right? So you can't just assume, you just always need to ask yourself, even if you have a pretty good idea, you know, what, what, what do customers really value? So for us, that was a big insight. Again, you never know, you never know. And um, in particular in the virtual space in the shift, even when everybody's doing stuff for free, you know, people see value in certain products and, and things. The other thing, and I just quick one on pricing in general. So I played around on Twitter with a couple of questions, right? I did a poll. And I asked, you know, you know, would you pay 75 bucks for a newsletter if I started one? And, you know, and I put two, four options. And then one person already said, oh, very bad experiment because A, it's people's opinion and you're telling, you're giving them the answer. I said, well, if it was my only experiment, yes, it would be a disaster. It would be, a, it would be really bad. But if you're doing 10, it's actually a very cheap 60 second experiment to just get a feel. What are people saying? Now, you don't take that as a basis for decision making. So there's this still is this thinking out there that you do one experiment and you make big decisions based on that. No, this was a 60 second experiment. It takes me 60 seconds to do it, one minute to analyze. And I've learned, OK, in what direction do I take my thing? So I think people need to also a little bit you know, grow up on it's going to be 10 experiments. And before I make one that takes me five minutes, why don't I do one that takes me one minute and then one that takes me a day, right? So we need to learn in terms of what, and again, David, I love the way you phrased it. You call it the, you know, the experiment sequence, right? So I think we really need to think more of in terms of sequences where you start with the cheapest and fastest just to get a feel. You're never going to make a decision based on that. But if you immediately start with something that takes you a day, you might have wasted a day. So don't waste a day when you can waste a minute, right? So there's this, I think this, this, this granularity and professionalism that we don't yet have um, and where we can still improve. Excellent. Um, so we've got a lot more questions coming in. So I'll move on to the next one. We've got one that's come straight out of the book. So uh, hopefully everyone's read it on here. Um, we have Ricardo who is asking, can you explain a little bit about the main challenges that you face using the concierge experiment? Well, that was for David for sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, it's culturally, it's always time. It, it, it's really interesting. When I tap into a team's creativity, they can always come up with a way, almost always, uh, to create a manual process to deliver what that thing should do. 
to deliver the value prop to the customer, they can almost always crazily go, well, if we do this and this and this and this, and just like do it this way, we can like hand deliver this value to them rather than going off and building some crazy, crazy behind the scene architecture. Um, but it's always time. So you think about how you're incentivizing a corporation or even, even in startups to an extent, I think startups do face this a little bit, is uh, you're not incentivized to be like creative and do something that might be a little slower, that doesn't scale to learn, you know? And so usually what I get pushed back is um, we don't have time to do that and we have to build. And it's like, wait, we don't have time to learn where the customer actually wants the outcome of the thing we're about to build, but we do have the time to go build that thing and scale it and then find out what happens. <laughs> so it seems really, when I say it out loud, it seems really silly, but that is always the pushback. It's not, it's not that they can't do it. Um, it's always the, well, we don't have time. We don't have, do, we don't have time to do things that don't scale. And my challenge to them is early on, you often do things that don't scale because you want to learn, you know? And you could take that learning and you can inform your overall business design and your, and your product design. But I, I think that's a cultural thing that we have to really grapple with inside organizations is that people aren't incentivized to do things that don't scale that emphasize learning. Because probably it's really hard to measure and we're not sure how that goes into their, uh, annual review, you know, it's always like, what did you deliver on what date? And it almost doesn't matter if that thing was successful or not. He's like, well, you hit the date and you delivered it because <laughs> it's easy to measure. So um, yeah, I, I think it's it's almost always time and just this cultural pushback on, I don't have time to do this. Like, I like the one of, yeah, the one of culture, right? Because, you know, the, the example I always like is, you know, Owlet, I don't know if you know this story, but, um, Owlet is this baby sock that monitors uh, the vital signs of a baby, and now it's a real product. But you know, when they started testing, they did things like a, a person in the room who would monitor the baby rather than a device. Now, again, it's the attitude, I think. So thinking that, oh, well, we don't have to build a device, but we can put a real person into that room watching the baby which might be a bit weird, right? But you do learn. So the, the challenge with those kinds of experiments is also to then understand what did you learn and what did you not learn and how does that actually relate to a device? So it is kind of a complex thinking because of course it's different when you have a person in the room. It's not the solution that you're gonna build. So sometimes people get a little bit confused around the variables. Okay, what was the difference is when we have a device, when we have a real person, what did we learn and what did we not learn? Because I think, you know, in the scientific, real scientific mindset, you know exactly which variables you're controlling. And I think in, in, in the whole testing movement, we're not always making those variables explicit enough. So it's like, oh, we put the solution in there. Yeah, but there are 25 things or 30 things that characterize that solution. How are you going to know it's because of this or because of that, that they didn't like it or didn't work? So you have to be able to narrow it down. So I think this, this comparison is, is not always easy between a scalable solution and a concierge type solution. So it requires some pretty interesting conversations, but I think it's a great underestimated tool because you can learn very quickly and you should invest the time. I love what you're saying, David, the, the time aspect, you know, they're just not allocating the costs well enough, I guess, to figure out what costs more time. Yeah, and just building really quickly off your answer, I think uh, coming back to how it biases things, uh, that, is, that is concerning and you should take it into consideration. So if we're gonna, let's say we wanna test out where to put a, um, a vending machine in a store, in a physical store. Um, well, we could just put a person there first and say, why don't you try to, with a little table and sell this thing to customers when they walk around. Um, that could go really well. And then you put the machine there and people walk right past it, right? Because it was a human biasing the thing. So biasing the experiment. So you do have to think about that, but I, I feel like time and time again, it's just, um, no, we got to go build the thing. We, we can't you know, do something manually that doesn't scale. Great, thank you both for your answers. So I've seen Marnie Landon has posted both in the chat and in the Q and A box. So definitely going to uh, have to add to her question. It's a bit more serious. It's a bit more down to earth, I guess, but it's, uh, it's in relation to COVID. And she's asking, how does COVID impact innovation positively or negatively? And will there be any further severe economic setbacks to follow? So it is an ask me anything. So put that one in there. I uh, would love to hear what you guys think about that. 
Dave, do you want to go ahead a little bit about, you did a lot of, I've seen recently, the testing in this context. I think that could be very interesting. You know, what does it actually mean for innovation and testing? Yeah, I mean, there have been others speaking out about this too, like Steve Blank, who I admire quite a bit uh, and pull inspiration from, just, just was speaking about this recently too. Um, I felt like he made a great point about uh, everyone's ho at home now. So those executives you couldn't get to before, now you can get to them. They don't have a personal system. They're not walled off. You can get to them on LinkedIn and their personal email and uh, other ways. And so I think there is a positive, even though we're all home and, and distributed, there's a connectedness that happens when we're all online that way. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm in California. We actually did pretty well when it first came out. Uh, and then we had a Memorial Day weekend and everybody kind of loosened up and partied. And now we're having biggest daily rates and spikes in COVID we've seen so far. And so I, I'm not impressed, uh, I will say, with the U.S.'s response from a government level uh, on what we've what we've done so far. I feel like it's a mess. Um, I think the positive side is um, it is going to force us. Uh, it's almost like uh, I heard this. I don't remember where I heard it recently, but it's almost like take things and fast forward them ten years. And so things that we thought were, you know, this remote work thing that there were some companies that were doing it and some companies dabbling in it and other companies that weren't trying it at all. Um, now it's we're forced to do it you know we're forced to figure it out and so i feel like it's just accelerated things it amplified things in a way that were already starting to be trends and it just forced us because of the constraints to figure it out and so i do think that's a positive i do think that taps into our kind of resilience and creativity and all these things were culturally not norms yet but because we're all suddenly remote um it's been accelerated and we're having to figure it out you know um but I do think it's going to yield some opportunities. I know, Alex, you have some uh, ideas about this, too, about what it does to us as businesses. But I think just as people, I think it's really tapping into like our creativity and can we things that maybe we felt like, oh, that won't work because it's online. Uh, my kids are taking karate online now, you know, <laughs> like there's, there's all this stuff that now it's just now that we're forced in this situation. It's not so much that we can't do it because it's online. That, that stigma is kind of getting um, actually obliterated. Yeah, I'll, I'll share <laughs> my little scribbles one more time. I think when, one of the big things, so two or three topics here, because there's a question with many answers, right? Um, if we look at innovation, I actually think um, COVID-19 might be a booster. And that's because I'm always very positive in my thinking. And the reason is, is why, because 90% of companies were disrupted by this. So their exploit is just, you know, you can't, they can't operate the same way. Some of the businesses completely, you know, expired. Take travel industry, hotel industry, right? So they're forced now to explore. So this is a disruption that affected every single company on the planet and very few positively. You could say Zoom and Netflix positively affected, right? They're disrupted, but in terms of scaling faster. And then you have obviously pharmaceutical companies which continue, but it is the disruption have it happened to everybody while disruption was a theoretical concept for most people before, because they knew it could happen, but you know how humans are when it's not in front of you and it doesn't hit you, well, it's not gonna happen to me. It's actually a human characteristic that we never think is gonna happen to us. So it just happened to everybody. So a lot of companies were forced to explore. So the awareness at the leadership level of disruption is a lot bigger. Now, where it's not clear is, are we going to go back to normal at one point where it's just going to say, okay, you know, we can work again, travel again, you know, business as usual. I do think the awareness is here and the exploration that some companies were forced to do will expand. The thing that is not quite clear yet, and this is now maybe a macro answer, is exploration requires money. Not that much, but it does require money, teams, right? You know, innovation teams. So there's a mixed signals right now. Some innovation teams got killed. Some innovation teams got scaled. But where for me personally, even for strategizers, it's not quite clear yet, is given what's happening in the US now with a surge um, of the virus, you know, what is the economic impact longer term? Because you can't escape this. You can't buy yourself out of this economic crisis, right? So if there are no consumers, you know, at one point, companies are not going to earn money and there are no more earnings. Like, you know, you just can't compensate putting money on the market. So that is, for me, a bit unclear. 
here, you know, are these budgets going into exploration and innovation safe? Uh, I think it can be positive, but depending a little bit on how, you know, the the consequences of the U.S.'s non-response <laughs> or, you know, bad crisis management, you know, look, it's, it is what it is, right? Because if you compare the curves right now, it's, it's, it's going up, right? It went down a little bit, now it's exploding. We don't know the economic consequences. So for innovation, that might actually be, it's not just for innovation, for every single company on the planet, we might just be at the very beginning of something very hard. That's unclear. Thank you both for, for your inputs on that. Actually, Matthew Holmes um, has just shared an article in the chat and it's, it's very relevant. He said, we found uh, collaboration was a great benefit of COVID. Um, I'll just leave that one there. Matthew, if you'd like to elaborate a bit more in the text then we'll, we'll pick that one back up. But um, I'll move on to the next question because we're getting a lot coming through here. So um, an anonymous attendee, so didn't want to be named, is do you have any advice for startup companies who have limited resources to test their hypothesis in the most cost-effective and efficient way? Do you have any tools, platforms that you can suggest to use and uh, to gain market and consumer insights? David, would you like to get that one off? Sure, I mean, I do a lot of uh, startup accelerator work um, and uh, I just did a, a really smaller workshop online yesterday where I took entrepreneurs through their own ideas for three hours. And it was just a group of 15, it was small. Um, but uh, what, I, what I did, and this is something we didn't have luxury doing in the book uh, with Alex, was listing out all the tools that match each experiment. And so there are reasons why you don't put all those tools in the book. One, there's new tools every day that you're gonna miss out on that are gonna be the hot new tool. And two, there's tools get acquired, shut down, et cetera. So, but in digital fashion, you know, when we do our workshops and master classes, and uh, we do experiment libraries that people can kind of go through with self-paced uh, and learn, um, we do have that mapping. So, for every kind of experiment, I have a list of tools that I that are my go-to. Uh, I shared some of those to the attendees yesterday. Uh, we're working on making that more robust, you know, with Alex uh, and uh, the team. But the the good news is there's almost like an overwhelming number of tools now. Um, the bad news is it's just hard to choose which one's going to help you the most. And so, um, you know, when you're doing research like search trend analysis using Google, using AdWords, using Moz or something to go in and see like, for this region, for this time period, are people actively seeking a solution, like coming, pulling from Steve Blank there, actively seeking a solution to a thing that I'm trying to solve? Because maybe you interviewed five to 10 people you don't know if it goes beyond them and can you go online and find out through discussion forums through search trend analysis through all these different things um so the short answer is yes there are plenty of tools out there for you i think that the challenge is always how do you match them to what you're attempting to actually perform and learn and we're working on that um uh, but the good news for startups a lot of those aren't very expensive you know um some of them are free um, I'm, I'm a big a big fan of the no code movement right now too. So even if you want to stitch stuff together in a mashup MVP, there there are tools that you don't have to really even know how to code. You can take Airtable and Zapier and you know uh, Unbounce and put it all together, and all of a sudden you get a product that, that kind of functions. You know, so there are all kinds of real cool things you can do. It's just always um, maybe even follow up after with this AMA with us, send us a note if there's a specific thing you're trying to explore because um, the, the biggest challenge is just picking the right tool for the job i would i would add to that that it's rarely a tool or cost well, two things first one is is the cost of failure bigger than the cost of you know a small subscription for certain tools right that's the first thing because startups you know kind of got into the habit that everything should be free but you know cost of failure is big so paying a little bit to validate your business model probably you shouldn't hold you back but the other one is i think it's rarely a tool problem um, because, you know, we're almost sometimes in this mindset, oh, I need to build something or I need this tool to test. No, you don't, right? So for a long time, there weren't any tools. <laughs> a little bit more energy you put into it. Um, but, you know, there are a lot of things you can do or you can hack together. And let me give you a silly example. Okay, number one, you can do interviews with people. It's a good start, but it's not enough, right? So we know there's so many things you can do before you ever build something, before you ever go to a tool. Next step, okay, you now know, okay, these are probably the challenges that uh, my customers might have. 
oh, what if I did a card sort thing just to get, you know, an idea of their priorities or another one, you know, this speedboat thing that we described so you understand the biggest pains, the smallest pains. That already starts to give you a pretty deep understanding of the challenges of your customers. Oh, now I understand the challenges. Maybe I also worked a little bit on the features that they like. Again, card sort, you know, speedboat. What if I made a PDF brochure? That's not very costly. And now I can start to send that to, you know, to customers. And of course, of course, this is all just discovery, but you can go very far and get very deep information before you kind of go into the tool. So I think, you know, there's this, and I'm not saying tools are not good. They're great. They can speed up certain things in particular when you start scaling your testing but I don't think tools are the real challenge. And if you don't have the money or don't want to spend the money, there's so many things you can do to get a really, really deep insight into customers, solutions, even willingness to pay, right? I think there's, there are tons of things we can do. And I'm not trying to say tools are not important, but it's, it's the smallest of all problems, I would say. Great, thank you both for your answers. We've got, um... Another one, we'll probably just take a few more. So um, if you do have any pressing questions, please get them into the, into the Q&A box and I'll, uh, I'll try my best to get through them. Uh, so Zane Gibbs has asked, can you talk about culture design and culture tests? How do you run them? Did you, David, did you ever run culture tests? I've never done culture tests. I can give an example afterwards, but maybe you have something there, I don't. <laughs> Well, I can, I can tell you how I um, approached um, organizational transformations. Um, and I certainly, there's an overlap in how I approach my work today. But, um, and I think Alex and I even whiteboarded this out one day in, uh, in San Francisco on a whiteboard wall. <laughs> um, but basically, uh, it's really interesting when I look at culture, cultural change in companies, uh, it's very much a map out your strategy the best you, you think. It's going to be wrong, by the way. But I usually use like a mind map with the executive team. And then how do we break off pieces to go try, right? And that that try might be really interesting. It might be a, a lunch and learn with the engineers. It might be like um, having like uh, some kind of social, like, um, uh, like um, I'm just trying to think of how to describe this. Like these like little meetings where you kind of work through things together and, and just test out these different dynamics. And maybe we, instead of through email, we do a video to share updates with our teams. Like, but it, it's all, uh, it's, it's all experimentation. And I think um, just personally, I had one of the scariest moments in my professional career when I was in, in front of the entire exec team of this really large uh, travel company. And I said, um, your, organ your, your transformation is just one big experiment. And, <laughs> and I thought, oh no, I said the inside part out loud. I shouldn't have done that. And they were like, actually, yeah, there's no way we could predict change in the culture in this org, like what it's going to do. And so it was really interesting because it kind of took the attention out of the air. And then we started realizing, hey, let's try and learn and keep experimenting our way through this. So I think it's so fascinating when I go into companies and they go, there's a bunch of test and learn people that come in and they go, well, here's your five-year culture change plan. And you're like, no, you can't. Like, what are you doing? So um, I have tried things. I just didn't call them a culture test, I think is the way you framed it. Uh, but I think it's exactly how you approach any kind of culture change. You can't plan it out because every time you make a little change, something else will happen you don't expect. And then that has uh, ramifications. So uh, yeah, I think it's just, it's just a really smart way to approach any kind of change in a, in a big company. I love that, you know, in particular also because, you know, again, it's about this whole idea of making plans when you know it's execution, but you don't know when you're transforming your culture what's going to work. So again, it's, it's admitting there's uncertainty that it's not an execution problem. I'll give you one concrete thing, but it's not about testing, but it was about culture, bringing in a culture of testing. So um, I worked with the CTO team of a Fortune 50 company. And they, they came to the masterclass with 20 people of their team. And then we did a debrief at their offices. And one of the ideas that we looked at was, okay, let's map out the biggest blockers to innovation, actually to this behavior of experimentation, et cetera. What's holding us back? And we just put on a flip chart, all of these things. So we had, I think about five teams. So they put up these things, all of the blockers today. 
you know, marketing is blocking us or whatever. And they, were, they, they don't know how to do this yet. And then here's the next thing we did. Okay, we said, well, on our flip chart, let's look at the things we can change within one week. Let's look at the things we can change within one month. And let's look at the things which we can change maybe within six months. I don't remember the exact time frames we looked at. And all of a sudden they saw there are some things, the blockers, they can eliminate immediately. They just never thought of it explicitly. There's some things that's going to take six months and probably never going to change, right? But they could immediately work on it. So here we weren't even in the land of assumptions. We were in the land of how do we tear down blockers, right? So wasn't cultural change and said we're going to make a big plan. What are the blockers today? Can we take them down or not? Can we take them down in a week? Can we take them down in a month? Can we take them down in six months? It was a brilliant exercise. And that for me was really that kind of eye opener. Um, also a conversation I had with Scott Anthony, great innovator and from Innosight. Um, we had a conversation when we were finalizing the book behind me, right? The, the Invincible Company, um, because we were talking about innovation culture and we looked at blockers and enablers. And then Scott Anthony wrote back to me at an email exchange, said, well, Alex, probably just need, we just need to work on blockers. Like the enablers are important at one point, but you know, just to get started to create an innovation culture, let's just take down the blockers because innovators are already driven to innovate. We're just putting too many obstacles in their way. So I think it's not a big planning exercise. And yes, I like that idea of testing certain aspects, but number one, Let's just eliminate the blockers first. There's a, those are low hanging fruits. So I think before we go into big cultural change exercises, which are great, must be done and are hard. Let's start with the easy stuff. Let's just take away the blockers. So for me, those two little stories, right? You know, having done it with a CTO team, had that conversation with Scott Anthony, um, was an eye opener in the sense that, well, there are low, low hanging fruits in terms of cultural change. Great. I think we have just about time for one more. Um, but before we do that, um, we had someone in the chat, Matthew Holmes, um, going back to this uh, idea of what COVID kind of did to collaboration. He said it's improved collaboration between people. He's actually been working on a project where they built, built a 3D printable vacuum powered ventilator. Sounds pretty intense as an answer to the UK Health Secretary's call for ventilators, said the demand has since gone away, but we have pivoted to a low cost um, tech ventilator. And now we're looking towards opportunities within um, uh, developing nations, refugee camps, uh, rescue helicopters. Uh, I just thought it was a great example to see um, people, uh, uh, Matthew is from uh, Durham University uh, in the UK. They said now that's kind of taken a life of its own. We've got companies like Black & Decker and Parker Hannafin getting involved in that kind of collaboration. So I, I guess the question there would be to David and Alex, um, what what kind of uh, impact do you think COVID will have on, on collaboration? Will it make it a lot um, easier to collaborate or will people be more kind of open to collaboration? I could speak a little bit to the US uh, specifically. I think, um, I think it's going to have some detrimental effects for in-person collaboration. Um, I don't see co-working spaces really surviving this. I think co-working spaces had, it was really tough business model anyway. And um, the fact that I don't think you're going to fill up open office seating plans anymore with people, even if you put plexiglass up or something like that. Um, I think a lot of the retailers are, are shutting down. Maybe those can be repurposed into some kind of spaces, but I feel like a lot of the in-person collaboration is um, is unfortunately just until we get this pandemic under control with some decent leadership, it, it's just gonna, we're, we're not even through our first wave. Um, it's spiking again, but we're still in the first wave here. And so um, I think remote, I think there's so much that can be improved. It, it, remotely, it feels like late, late 90s, early 2000s.com to me, you know? It's like, we're all figuring out the web and we're all building for like 10 different browsers and, uh, uh, dating myself a little bit here, but it was like lots of long weekends going, this didn't work at IE5, you know? Um, sorry, I'm not traumatizing anybody with that comment, hopefully. But basically, um, I feel like this is where we are now with video, you know? Like Zoom's great, but like it could be a lot better. Um, 
when you go to online conferences, you don't get to hang out people in, in the hallways. Like we're trying to recreate that experience with our master class, obviously, but most it's just a talk. And then there's, you don't know who you're with. And, and, and so I think we have a long ways to go, but we're just scratching the surface. I think virtual collaboration could be amazing. It just feels very early adopter stage still, even though we have some pretty established tools. I, I just think there's so much that can be improved. I think um, what happened, what's interesting is when, since people are not traveling at the moment, people are more available. So all of a sudden you can, it's much easier to get the right people into the room for a meeting. So that, you know, it's, it's much easier. So the, they're actually the consequences are more meetings, <laughs> but you can get the right people in the room. So you don't have to compromise on that. That's a big boost to innovation because you're going to get the right people who can make the right decisions into a room. That is very powerful. I'd build on what David just said. I think there's a very poor virtual meeting culture in the sense that just talking heads, right? What, what you want to do is you want to use a visual kind of like, you know, virtual sticky notes. You want to put that up. So when we do our projects and strategizers, that's what we do at the virtual masterclass. There's this experience of you do exercises, not just by talking to people and watching slides. And so, no, you do real stuff in a virtual space as if you were working on a wall. And that is now taking off, right? So I'm hearing a lot of people saying, wow, we didn't even know that was possible. So they're moving away from just talking heads because that's the worst possible form of collaboration. It's called blah, 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 also commonly, just what, what, what we're doing now, David and I. <laughs> uh, but, but that's really been a huge shift. And I think that is phenomenal. And it allows, I think, also the impact, you know, generally on the world in terms of uh, environment. And so we'll see the strengths of not traveling and we'll also learn where you know physically meeting makes sense. So I think when we get out of the pandemic and we can travel again, we'll have a completely different attitude. We'll use face-to-face -face when face-to-face -face is really required, and we'll use virtual when virtual can help us scale and go faster. So far, you know, we're working with some companies. They say, "Oh, virtual, you know, telemedicine wasn't a topic <laughs> until the pandemic hit. Now everybody wants to work with that team that was dissed, you know, just a couple of months ago. Wow. Okay. So there's a realization of the strengths of virtual. I'm not saying everything should be virtual, but there's a realization. So I think collaboration is going to take a completely different form. We'll have less face-to-face, -face, but we'll use face-to-face -face where it really creates value. We'll have more virtual, but we'll also have better virtual. So I, I do think in terms of how we collaborate, this is a game changer, but again, you know, it also requires not just jumping on Zoom and talking. It requires using visual tools, structured, you know, like we in, in testing business ideas, we show how you do testing in a structured way, how you visualize your hypothesis and then prioritize. All of that is not, might be common sense, but it's not common practice yet. Yeah, those are some great answers. And I think that brings us nicely kind of to the end of the session. And um, just on a final note, um, you know, this whole session has uh, been created and kind of sponsored by our um, upcoming uh, masterclass in, in September. So um, I don't know, Alex and David, would you like to just give a, a little note on this before, before we finish off today's session? Yeah, I'm excited about it. I think, uh, you know, we're working really hard to make sure it's very interactive and, and, and virtually hands-on. Uh, and we had a blast at the London Masterclass before this pandemic hit. I, I, I was so bummed, you know, I was looking to do those everywhere, you know, because everyone was testing the real like ideas and getting out of the building and coming back. It was such a fun experience um, working with Alex and Francisca and the team. Uh, so uh, we're, we're working really hard to uh, make sure it's just as good online. And um, again, it's, it's not going to be a webinar. I, I don't know how else to explain that. I think we still have this, you know, people think online training are just webinars and they show up 15 minutes late and then they just expect to uh, not do any work. And, and that's not our style. So if you come, like prepare to do work, prepare to, to kind of learn. And it's intense. Like three days of this uh, is going to be mentally exhausting for you in, in a good way. So we're really excited to, to, to host everyone. And I think, you know, what's really fun doing this with David is the level of professionalization of the testing process. You know, when you don't go through this, you don't realize. So it's not just about, oh, using sophisticated tool and a lot of data. No, it goes down to 
what's a good hypothesis? How do I prioritize my hypothesis? How do I select the right experiment at the right time? How do I make quick experiments here and there? So it's just fun to see how we're trying to push the boundaries, the level of professionalism. I believe testing is now not an ideology anymore. It's becoming a profession. Might sound a little bit boring, but you know, it's, it's starting to be a profession like accounting. Maybe that's not the best sales pitch I'm doing right now, <laughs> but there's, there is a level of professionalism that we try to bring into you know, startups, um, large established companies that I, I think is personally, I think it's unprecedented. So we're really trying to push the boundaries beyond the book even, right? So there's a lot of new content in there already. Great. Thank you both. What a, what a great session. We've had all sorts of questions. Um, sorry for the, I, I took all different kinds of ones because um, it is an ask me anything quest, uh, session. So um, we're trying to get as many questions in there as possible. But uh, thank you both David and Alex for taking the time today uh, to answer everyone's questions um, about the book, about innovation, about testing. Um, it's always great to host these sessions when we can. And uh, yeah, thanks to our lovely audience to you know, spent time to, to, to want to learn with us today and, and ask these questions and, and be involved in the conversation. So thank you to everyone um, who's participated. And if you do have any questions, please email me at webinars at um, strategizer.com and I will um, hand over these questions to Alex and David and we could perhaps do some follow-up sessions um, around that. But thank you everyone. Have a lovely day wherever you are around the world and uh, hopefully see you soon. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Matt, David. Thanks. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everyone. See ya. If you do want to connect in the chat box, feel free to put your LinkedIn or uh, whatever contact details you want. We like to keep the community thriving here. Otherwise, I shall turn off my camera um, and I wish you all a lovely day. Bye, everyone.